And that's a wrap on the market this week. So I've got to say it's pretty nice to be back in all-time high territories. As I mentioned on Twitter, I'm actually running a competition right now to guess the, you know, when the market's going to reach that one billion mark. So follow me over there and give me your best guess on the first day that we're going to reach one billion in total market cap. And I'm going to give the winner a shout out here on the show. But with that, I think it's time to dive into the hot main topic this week, which is also very hot in the community right now, which is whether NFTs are security tokens or if they're just plain old commodities. That's great stuff. All-time highs are always a great thing for the market. I have no idea when that $1 billion mark is. I hope it's freaking tomorrow, but we'll find <laughs> out soon enough. Love to hear all your guesses, listeners. And yeah, this is a very interesting conversation. I think it's important to first remind, of course, everyone here that we are not attorneys. We are not securities attorneys. We are not giving out legal advice here. Uh, but instead, we are going to try to break down what all this hype is about surrounding non-fungible tokens, NFTs, and how these digital assets relate to the security token framework. So there hasn't been any SEC clarity on this front either. So really, all of this is speculation. But with that being said, I think we should define some of our variables here. You know, when we're talking about NFTs, we're talking about these non-fungible tokens. They're a vehicle you'd use to represent a specific asset like a collectible or art or any unique item, you know, most commonly with a very limited supply. That's exactly right. The, the very nature of a non-fungible token is that it can't just be replaced by another one and it can't be split into fractional shares. I mean, think of it just like a collectible baseball card. The value of the asset is predicated on the fact that it's a unique item and the time of printing along with the quality, scarcity, and outside demand are key factors in determining what the market value of that thing might be. And so NFTs are trying to take that proof of ownership to the next level by creating digital assets whose supplies are originated on chain. So in that way, we know exactly how many of each NFT has been created and exactly who owns it, pretty much totally eliminating fraud from these industries by creating a system of ownership that's so easy to verify from anyone around the world. So, I mean, Herwig, what are some of the leading use cases for NFTs so far we've seen in the market? Well, it's definitely one of the larger industries, and I think maybe the most intuitive example of an NFT is, you know, digital art. So platforms like Super Rare, so, so Rare, you know, they created full digital marketplaces for graphic designers to sell their digital art, including images, short videos, and a lot more. You know, there are a lot of even trading card games. I mean, you may have heard of Gods Unchained, which sells packs of NFT cards that a buyer can then use to compete against their friends and in tournaments. You know, kind of similar to like Pokemon or Magic the Gathering, and uh, or maybe even recently Hearthstone, you know, they've done a lot of traditional collectible scene type stuff, but this time it's all digital and NFTs. And, you know, maybe another one that maybe people have definitely heard of was back in 2017, Crypto Bull Run. You know, we actually saw the NFTs known as Crypto Kitties, you know, collectible cats whose name to fame was causing severe blockages <laughs> in the Ethereum network due to the demand for them and the strain on the early, you know, version of Ethereum. So that's right, people, let that sink in. Digital cats as NFTs strained the Ethereum network. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, while CryptoKitties might have actually been seen as a joke at the time, it's actually done about 29 million in sales to over 90,000 buyers to date. <laughs> so even more impressive than that, the company behind it, Dapper Labs, is also behind NBA Top Shot, which is a marketplace to buy and sell trading card versions of top highlights from NBA games each night. And NBA Top, top Shot has become insanely popular with over 5.6 million in sales in just the last 24 hours. They've done about 75 total, 75 million, excuse me, total sales since the company launched in just October. And it's it's kind of like trading cards, except you might own LeBron James's famous block in the finals against the Warriors instead of owning his rookie card. The NFT space is blowing up with nearly 150 million in sales to date across dozens of industries from gaming to art to music. I mean, that's a big business. Yeah, that's absolutely. I mean, actually, Dapper Labs, that company behind the uh, CryptoKitties and, and uh, Top Shot, there just announced a two hundred and fifty million dollar <laughs> fundraising round at over two billion dollar valuation to scale their current marketplaces. So, on top of, of course, probably improving their purpose built NFT blockchain that they have, which of course CryptoKitties and NBA Top Shot NFTs are both issued on that. Yeah, I believe it's called Flow is is the blockchain that they've built out for that. But now that we've laid exactly what NFTs are, I think maybe. It it's time to dig into the financial mechanics behind art as an asset and maybe how that translates to the digital world. So Herwig, could you walk us through that a little bit? 
I can try, you know. So in the context of tokenized art, I think there's really two ways that you should be looking at it from a structural perspective. In the digital world, I'd say it's pretty easy. We can take a digital collectible and assign its ownership rights to a digital, of course, non-fungible token, which can then be sold on a marketplace to the highest bidder. This is really no different than what you'd see in the traditional world. Just instead of a certificate of authenticity, you know, we're using a digital token on a public ledger. However, when you're trying to create a digital token that represents a real world physical collectible, I think it doesn't get so simple. We still need to bridge the gap between the tangible item and the blockchain based asset. How else could you know that you have true ownership of it? And so in order to do that, an issuer normally would create an SPV that's a special purpose vehicle, which would then acquire and own and sometimes manage, you know, if you will, the asset. And from there, an issuer could sell shares of the shell company to investors, which gives them exposure to the underlying asset, you know, in of course a fractional way. It's very similar uh, to a system of steps that we've seen in the structure of individual tokenized real estate properties, as well as since it's an incredible, versatile, and proven method, of course, to unlock liquidity, liquidity, you know, in traditionally illiquid assets like collectibles. Yeah, right. So, I mean, we could have two types of assets really to consider here, right? One that's just digital proof of ownership via an NFT, and then one that's actually direct ownership of an asset through what's essentially an equity investment. So remember folks, we're not lawyers, but this differentiation is incredibly important. If you own your artwork outright, you're really just purchasing a unique good, like a rare pair of Nike shoes or a painting from Art Basel. However, when you're purchasing a business interest in art for the expectation of that future profit, like in the case of owning fractionalized shares of an art piece, then you definitely need to make sure you're adhering to all applicable securities laws. You know, this separation I think is really critical. It dictates the rules and requirements around who is allowed to purchase these tokens, of course, where the user can sell their tokens and how an issuer handles the liability for the asset. So NFTs, which are really just collectible goods that are not publicly verifiable, can be traded on marketplaces anywhere without requiring those regulatory licenses that you know, security token platforms need when they trade securities. So, however, it also proves that incredible value of security tokens to open an opportunity for investors around the world to invest in real world art itself. At the end of the day, when you own an NFT, you're owning a digital painting or a collectible you could see or access anywhere, while owning a physical artwork can be a unique viewing experience that is very difficult to replicate virtually. So, you know, however, real artwork can easily sell for tens of hundreds or even millions of dollars. And there is a huge demand for fractional ownership of a classic asset class that you know simply has been seen as revered for, for centuries. Yeah, I mean, security tokens pave the way for that increased access by opening investment to economies globally while bringing the cost down through fractionalization, which is not necessarily an option in the NFT space. If, if fractional ownership was available, it too might begin to look like a security as investors really would only be purchasing that small share in the pure hope of future profits, which is a big no-no for the SEC if you're not following those securities laws. Yeah, yeah. Ultimately, the line will always be drawn there by the Howey test. That's the case law used by the SEC to determine whether something is a security or not. One of the major prongs for something to become a security is that there is an expectation of profit. So NFTs that don't follow securities laws but represent real-world collectibles start to potentially blur that line and could be seen as security tokens. You can definitely be both. So that's why Curio Invest in Switzerland, for example, issues security tokens representing their collectible cars like their tokenized Ferrari, not just NFT tokens that anyone can go and buy and trade anywhere. Yeah, that's a great example, Herwig. I think there's one resounding benefit in the NFT space that I know will eventually permeate into the traditional art space and, and many of these other you know collectible industries, and that's really counterfeit protection. Many collectible industries such as art, fine wine, and others are plagued with fake and counterfeit goods that just dilute the, the supply of quality goods available for, for investors and for enthusiasts. And so with NFTs, that serial number on each token is embedded into the blockchain at the creation of that token, and which one day may become the gold standard for verification of authenticity, no matter whether we're talking digital or physical art. Yeah, that's just a general great use of the blockchain, right? We know that Currency Works is working on a platform like mm -hmm. that for art. Uh, and however, though, it must be mentioned that the transaction can be separate from an ownership ledger, right? So again, we blur the lines for NFTs and security tokens in that regard. Ultimately, I think it's a fascinating space. And, you know, Dapper Labs' fundraise marks yet another unicorn leveraging blockchain in new ways. So they've clearly proven a model that's going to grow to massive heights. 
and other firms will deploy NFTs in ways that could trigger security token traits and end up being seen as that by regulators. So get you know great legal counsel if you're exploring an <laughs> NFT project. Yeah, that's always great advice. And with that, I think that's about all that I've got in the NFT section. I think the same for me, Kyle. It's still a burgeoning space and we'll continue to keep our eye on it, of course, and update you with all the latest developments. But for now, I want to thank you all for tuning in and listening to another episode of the Security Token Show. And I hope to catch you again next week on Tuesday or Thursdays at our Clubhouse session at 5. Yeah, please submit any news at stlmarket.com and also grab the latest pricing data there from Security Token Market. Again, feel free to reach out to us on Twitter or LinkedIn with any questions or feedback. And thanks so much for listening. Talk to you next week. Mm -hmm.